everyone knows, the primary purpose of today's webinar is, of course, a candid and we hope a comprehensive discussion about microservices-based design um, and architecture. And probably even more important for this audience is why are microservices so important to the future of the media industry? I just a second before we get into that, though, I just had a couple, uh, one or two little statements sort of to set the stage um, before we get into the discussion. Uh, the first is that microservices um, are important. They're a big deal, and, it, and not to overstate the, the point, but they are at the very core of today's leading technology companies. Yeah. Microservices design is fueling both the platform and the business philosophy behind the way some of the most successful companies, and Netflix, Uber, Airbnb, just to name a couple, the way these uh, companies develop and manage their services. Um, microservices, um, is, I think it's fair to say, are a key building block underlying the transformation of businesses to you know, IT slash IP slash cloud environments, basically you know, all things virtualized. And the design architecture is also critical um, to the that the way modern enterprises run their businesses today too. It's, uh, it's, so this is just about a discussion about cloud-based uh, operations, and that's something that we'll get into a little bit later. So the reason this discussion we're about to have is important to media companies is that there's really not, uh, you know, there's no longer any reasonable doubt that any broadcaster that wishes to remain competitive and relevant in the future is really going to need to uh, eventually migrate to a more agile and flexible technology foundation. That, that you know, supposition that um, uh, IP is the future, it's really entered sort of the realm of, uh, of the inevitable at this point. So if there's a big takeaway from today's discussion, it should be that whenever you make your move to IP, whether that's tomorrow, two years from tomorrow, it's really important that you embrace or at least have a good understanding of a microservices design strategy. So Darren's job over the next 40 minutes, uh, the tough job is to really explain why that's the case and, and make the case for why microservices are important. So Darren, um, it, you know, as I say, let's let's start at the beginning, maybe with a definition. Um, what exactly are microservices? Sure. Thank you very much, Joe. So I think actually, before delving into microservices, it's a good idea to add some context uh, describing how we've progressed in the industry thus far, uh, and this is really about how we've embraced this transition from traditional appliance-based solutions uh, into more software-based approaches and more virtualized approaches, perhaps COTS-based and software-based solutions. Um, these have really become accepted parts of our technology ecosystem. Basically, it's becoming more and more common to, to hear about software-based processing. And in fact, it's even getting more common to hear about uh, virtual machines and DMs and, uh, and how they're being utilized. Um, so, the essence of a virtual machine is effectively to take uh, an application along with an operating system, you take an image out of that, uh, and then out of that entire image you create uh, a, a deployment in a remote location in a separate platform, and that's sort of what a virtual machine entails. Uh, the next, and what we've been hearing a lot about in the industry lately, uh, is this concept of containers. Um, so, for example, uh, Docker would, would be a container that's very popular in use. Uh, basically, that's a more optimized way of separating applications and achieving virtualization. Effectively, what it means is that you have a singular operating system um, along with isolated applications uh, and application processes uh, to accomplish separate discrete goals rather than having this big uh, VM images in, in the virtual machine space. Uh, now, what microservices actually represent is the next phase in that journey. It's, it's a fundamentally different way of developing. Um, and we're going to use this term cloud native. Um, uh, and that's a little bit different from cloud enabled, which we'll talk about in the future. Uh, and it, but it also does not necessarily mean that it's cloud exclusive. We'll, we, we will come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but what it really means is that there's no direct reliance on the operating system. Uh, and inherently, that the application, or at least the solution, was developed natively for an environment where everything can operate as a service. So when we say that it operates as a service, we really mean like everything from storage to networking or even uh, any sort of computer processing tasks. Those can operate as a service, and then uh, we interface those together to, to solve a solution. So in short, when we have a microservice, or, or perhaps more appropriately, a microservices-based architecture, uh, what it really is is an approach to both software development uh, as well as deployment. 
that can isolate the application from the underlying infrastructure completely. Uh, the goal really is lighter weight, easier deployment, uh, easier maintenance, um, but without these big applications. Um, and these are really going to, to work better in a cloud-native uh, sort of paradigm. So I think the first step when you're thinking of microservices is to consider what you're trying to accomplish as an overall problem. And then you break that problem down uh, into discrete functional elements. Uh, in, uh, usually these are going to be processes. Um, but basically what you try to do is to, to decouple and decompile your larger problem uh, into a set of small steps. So uh, what you would generally do is you take a very large solution uh, generally represented as an application, and you break it down into its smallest reasonable components or, or functionalities. Uh, and again, each of these would typically run in their own process or uh, as a separate service. Uh, and this, it's important to note that this applies to not just how software developers approach the solution, but also to how uh, like a solution architect or, or an enterprise uh, um, design deployment methodology uh, is planned. Um, so sort of at both ends of that spectrum, from the actual software implementation to the actual the deployment, there needs to be this conscious and active intent uh, to separate these functionalities into their smallest reasonable elements. So it applies to when the software developers implement a solution. They do it in such a way that the functionality can be compartmentalized. Uh, but it also applies to the operation team, the, the system architects or solution architects, um, and even the operations department, so that they leverage those exact same principles uh, in their deployment. The idea is that then you then take these individual uh, microservices and you, and you chain them together. This is usually referred to as a service chain. Uh, and we do this to, to solve a particular problem. And then you can chain these service chains together uh, into uh, you know, more and more complex uh, and involved solutions. And in this way, we can in, in solve more complex and involved problems. The key, however, to all of this is that you're continuing to work uh, and you have visibility into these very small uh, independent processes. Oh, great. That, um, great there. Now, that sort of was in the, um, I guess, in the clinical or the, the generic realm. Can you bring it back and, and, and tie it to the um, to the, the media industry. So what are some examples of microservices in a, in a broadcast environment? Sure. So I, I think maybe a good example of this is to look at a, a typical broadcast plant. And, and the way that we typically gone about deploying a full end-to-end -end, um, solution for broadcasting purposes is that you have all of these discrete appliances. So you might have uh, ingest devices, you might have processing um, uh, appliances, you might DA, switchers, playback systems, uh, graphics, loudness correction, et cetera. Um, um, typically in a baseband world, what we would do is we would connect these together uh, over SDI, so some coax and some VNCs that are all chaining these individual um, uh, functionalities represented by appliances together. Um, in, in the software or IP-based world, uh, these might be replaced with you know, 2022-6 centers and receivers rather than over SDI. Um, but what you can do is you can consider each of those individual appliances as sort of minimum microservices. Um, but I think we can even do a little bit better. We, we can take each of those individual appliances and we can sort of decompile what, they, what each of them are, are, are doing from a functional standpoint. Uh, and then we can, we can create microservices out of that. So take, take for example, uh, something like a, uh, a, a playout system. So if we have a playout system, it's, it's made out of obviously the, the, the playout functionality, but there's also a graphics engine, an internal switcher, but there's also things like closed caption integration or audio processing. So what we can do is we can take all of those and all those sub-elements and we can create them as potential microservices. So we might have a graphics microservice, we might have a caption microservice, or an audio processing microservice. And then we can chain these together to create a service chain and, and effectively realize the same sort of functionality that that playout uh, server uh, would achieve. Uh, and we can do that across all the various aspects of a broadcast plan. And so each of those larger um, appliance-based models get deconstructed or decompiled into their smallest functional elements. Each of those become microservices, and then we can chain them together to solve a solution. Uh, 
I think maybe the easiest way to think about uh, the potential of microservices is to take every part of the broadcast network today uh, and uh, think about them as running as independent software processes and then uh, working together on a common communication backplane uh, to achieve a particular goal. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'm left with the, uh, I guess it's image in my head of sort of all these processes, you know, realizing software sort of floating around, you know, and chained together. Um, can you talk about, uh, I guess the gap in my, in my thinking is, can you talk about, you know, the, sort of the, connect, the connected tissue and, and how these things are linked together? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question. Uh, typically microservices, when they're chained together, uh, they're, they're not directly applicable to um, or at least we haven't seen them as directly applicable to, to broadcast to media. Um, so in the past, it might be things like uh, uh, telco-related uh, communication, and there's a lot of um, uh, database communication uh, activities and that sort. Um, but when we actually apply it to a broadcast or media operations infrastructure, um, we have to consider how we're going to be passing these big frames, this big uh, sets of information between them. And, and the, the fact is, is that there isn't a one particular type of transport protocol that applies. The fact is, is that it all comes down to the application. It comes down to what you're trying to solve. Um, so in, in some cases, it's going to end up being 2022-6. Uh, so each service will be normalized to interface with 2022-6 as an example. So uh, each and every one of these will have an input that has 2022-6 and another would have an output that uh, corresponds to that. Uh, but that doesn't mean it has to be that. It could instead be all transport streams. So you could connect them all using multicast traffic or uh, perhaps AES-67 or, 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 or any of these sorts of things. The fact is, is that um, the, the key point here is that microservices by definition don't necessarily have a particular communication element. It's more of an architectural style. But when you implement a microservices deployment, um, what you do is you determine what the best communication backplane is going to be. Uh, and in some cases, we, we can look at sort of newer uh, communication protocols like RDMA uh, to, to uh, achieve the same benefits of microservices, but all of the performance of in-memory communication. Um, and so really the question is, it, or the answer to that question is, it, it depends. Got it. Okay. Just um, switching, uh, getting into this a little bit deeper, then maybe let's talk about what a microservice isn't, right? Um, uh, so a popular definition uh, of a microservice-based design is that it is a deconstruction of monolithic design principles. So can, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe compare and contrast the, these two approaches? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when you think of monolithic design or monolithic applications, um, the, these are pretty much what, what we're typically used to seeing as a software application. Uh, putting aside some of those more recent advancements that you described in your introduction there, Joe, um, monolithic application design is what we typically associate with an application in, in a, um, you know, either in a processing application or in, in a desktop application. Um, and, and really the characteristics of these are that you have a set of ins and outs, a set of inputs and outputs, and uh, you have a set of configuration parameters for that. But really what we have is black box. And that black box uh, really gives very little insight into the underlying or internal operations of the function. It's a set of ins and outs and a set of parameters, and that's, and that's about it. So the problem with this is that if you want to adjust or augment or modify um, that the behavior of that application is going to be, it's pretty much expected. The, the way that the, you would do that is that you go back to the source code, you make the necessary changes, and then you recompile the application into a new black box. And there might be some new ins and outs and some new configuration parameters, but you're still faced with that, um, that, that sort of lack of visibility into what's happening, and not just lack of visibility, but lack of control or flexibility into what's going on. Now, you might change some of these, these big black boxes together, uh, to achieve a, a workflow, um, but it's still really pretty opaque as to what's going on under the hood um, within each of these separate functionalities. So not only does this present a pretty huge reliance on the initial developer, because you're effectively handcuffed into whatever that black box they've given you is, uh, and you have to go back to them if you want any of these changes, but it also introduces a lot of risk. The, the fact is, is that as these monolithic applications grow, um, so does their instabilities and potential for errors. 
it's pretty much understood in software development that the more an application grows, and this is both just in pure lines of code as well as in its breadth of functionality, um, so too does the risk grow. So the fact is, is that when you're trying to make a change to these big monolithic applications, the more you try and change it, the, the more unstable it gets and the more expensive and difficult it is to make these changes. Microservices, on the other hand, uh, attempts to provide a, a greater level of flexibility and, and visibility uh, into that processing pipeline. So by isolating the functionality into these discrete services, uh, rather than hiding them into this big monolithic application, but we're, we're really trying to address a lot of these short these shortcomings. Um, we can add a lot of functionality simply by adding new microservices. So we can simply connect that new microservice into an existing pipeline to make use of it. This means it's faster and easier to add new functionality, as well as being much less risky. Um, so some of the, the standard comparisons to microservices might be compared to Lego blocks. And while that's not necessarily a great analogy, it's just simply because microservices can be quite a bit more rich and um, uh, varied than what my Lego blocks might be, uh, it, it's useful in that visual sort of uh, comparison where you can take all of these very small elements and then by connecting them together in different ways, create something, uh, something that's much less risky. Got it. Uh, the, the Lego block so it makes a great image, so you can see that's pretty cool, too. Um, I just wanted to go back on something you said about, I think you used the term handcuff, um, uh, to, uh, to relate the idea that, you know, you sort of tying now, there's a, the, the, the structure, the, the, the size and the complexity of a monolithic application sort of um, ties it to a particular vendor or, or really limits what you can do in terms of openness. Is that the case? Um, I would guess then that microservices, there's a, there's a, a, a you know a, an application or or a process that's based on microservices would be a little bit more um, accessible like to a third party or even to mm -hmm. a you know the, the technology provider. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you can still have a microservices deployment style or architecture without necessarily being open to third party development, but that really is one of the goals and one anybody's implementing a microservices deployment, it really should be with an idea that you're working against a common API where um, multiple entities, be it the actual customer or the provider or, or some separate third party, can add to it. And if you compare that to the monolithic approach, if you're trying to modify a big monolithic application, that inherently comes with a lot of risk, as we said, um, but it also comes with a lot of in-house knowledge. So trying to switch from one development team or one developer even to another to modify that, well, first off, they need access to the source code, um, uh, which, you know, obviously isn't always going to work. Um, but it also means they need to have knowledge of that monolithic application. If instead what you do is you build against a common API, something where um, you just add a microservice, it, it becomes very easy to, to augment whatever that collection of microservice technologies um, are, are offering at one particular point in time. Uh, and if you do it against a common API, that means it's, it's extensible beyond just your company or beyond just the provider that you initially work with. And that really is an ideal model. That is really what uh, an ideal microservices deployment entails so that it is extensible and, and, and doesn't handcuff you in that way. Got it. Great. Okay. So let's... Um Let's sort of move into the, the why it matters uh, portion of the discussion. So, so, Darren, what you've been talking about here, it, it really seems like it's it's pretty low-level building blocks, you know, software code. But um, so the question is, why should media company executives, let alone, you know, the, the technical staff, broadcast engineers, be concerned about, you know, these building blocks and microservices? Why, why, is, why should it be important to um, the, at all levels of an organization? Um, yeah, so th there there are a lot of reasons, um, but maybe, maybe let's just start with an example. Um, so take, for example, a, a word processor. Uh, many of us, you know, use these very powerful word processors, but in all likelihood, uh, most of us barely use one-tenth of the, all the features and functionality or, or power of that application. The problem with that is that 
what ends up happening is that, well, first off, we're paying for 100% of that application. So to get access to that one-tenth of functionality, we're paying for 100% of the application. But it also means that every time you want to update it, you need to download the entire thing, even though you're using only a small portion or even though only a small portion of it will have changed. Um, now, that's just a word processor, but now compare that to the complexity of today's broadcast environments. You're paying for 100% of all of that technology, processing power and network utilization, but you may only be using a fraction of the features. Um, so effectively, what, what microservices allow you to do is to design more efficient um, networks and processes because you can isolate the functionality to be precisely what you need it to be. Uh, the second biggest reason, and arguably the more important reason, is flexibility. So because these microservices allow you to um, compose these dynamic services that are smarter, that they're on the shared technology, that are flexible in deployment, um, it, it allows you to respond quicker. And the fact is, is that our industry today has really never seen the level of disruption that we're seeing today. Uh, it's, it's really becoming more and more difficult to predict changing consumer habits and demands. Um, and, and in fact, it's even worse than just the changing demands because consumers are demanding that new functionality even faster than ever before. Um, so what this really means is that without some sort of crystal ball, the, the real answer, the, the, re the response to that is to become more agile. We need to be able to respond to the changing business landscape quicker uh, and importantly, without disrupting existing operations. Um, and so to kind of go a little bit further on that, the fact is, is it, it's more demanding and it's more difficult to work with, but it also means that there's more potential opportunity. There may be new alternative ways to make money, and this could be through new markets or it could be through monetization, a new monetization strategies that you know become available with the new um, consumption platforms that we see. So. In order for us to continue to, to expand and to continue to grow as an industry, uh, we need to be able to experiment with these new ideas. But we need to do it in such a way that our money-making, tried-and-true, bread-and-butter sort of operations aren't disrupted. It, it, we need to be able to experiment with these new things without having to bring down or impact the rest of our, of our operations. Uh, what microservices allow us to do is to layer in these new services and, and do so in, in such a... Uh, less disruptive way. Uh, it no longer means these big modifications to big monolithic applications. Instead, we can just layer in new microservices to explore new opportunities. And again, because this is typically on COTS hardware, we can actually change the nature of those um, systems uh, in a much less expensive way and do this without a big forklift of equipment. We're no longer talking about big changes to big appliances, we just sort of change slightly the behavior of what that cost-based system is just by layering a new microservice. So it really gives this level of responsiveness and flexibility um, that is actually becoming more and more important in our, in our industry today. Got it. But um, I guess I want to make sure that this isn't just important to companies like Netflix and Hulu or, or even, you know, the Ubers and the Airbnbs of the world, for that matter, that those who grew up on or, or sort of data the IP networks? No, no, I think I think that it's important to, to any technology company, uh, really, that's looking to stay competitive today. And that this is sort of regardless of their background or their pedigree. Um, I, I don't really think it's debatable that in today's world or, or, or industry that, that we're going to be transitioning to, to IP and to COTS and perhaps even to some form of cloud. Uh, and I think that the industry recognizes that uh, it's pretty clearly understood that software and virtualization are going to be big parts of that. Um, that. What microservices allows you to do is to really take advantage of these technologies, these transitions to that IP and COTS and software-based world. That's really what microservices allow you to do. In a lot of ways, it's actually interesting you mentioned Netflix and Hulu uh, because these are precisely the forward-thinking companies that have had such a disruptive influence on our standard broadcast market. Uh, and in order for more traditional companies, so to speak, to remain competitive, um, that will require a lot of the same sort of thinking because we are seeing that influence in competitive competitiveness from 
different and new competitors who really are looking at the world a little bit differently. Got it. Okay. Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier you use the term cloud native, uh, gets thrown around a lot or is starting to get thrown around a lot. Um, and it's often offered as a sort of uh, an opposition or contrast to the term cloud enabled. Um, so what's the difference between cloud native and cloud enabled? And um, and what's that? What's the connection with microservices? <clears throat> sure. Um, so oftentimes when we see virtualized or cloud deployments, what we're really talking about is is VM images that really act more like bare metal installs or <clears throat> even appliances. So what we really end up doing is you take an on-prem bare metal install, you, you take a big image out of it, and then you deploy that whole image on, on a cloud or VM environment. Uh, now, there's still a benefit to that type of virtualization because it, it does offer some flexibility to scale, but then you're still faced with the same limitations of a typical monolithic design like we discussed before. Um, that sort of porting of a bare metal installation is generally referred to as cloud-enabled. So it, it can run in the cloud, but it doesn't necessarily take advantage of the cloud. Something that's cloud-native, on the other hand, means that it was developed specifically with the cloud in mind. So this is very much aligned with what the microservices style of development uh, entails. Uh, a cloud-native de design or cloud-native solution uh, isn't just a port of that bare metal installation. It's instead an architectural plan right from the, from the beginning of development uh, that isn't limited by the idea of running on a single machine with a constrained set of performance parameters. Um, but basically, cloud-native design recognizes that the cloud means it's easy and cheap to spin up a new host machine, and it leverages that from the ground up in its design methodology and its architecture. So it's important to note that, that a cloud-enabled really describes an application or a process that's designed uh, for a local host but can be run in the cloud with some overhead and cost. Cloud-native means instead that it's inherently designed for the cloud, and if it's based on microservices, it'll be flexible, scalable, and uh, um, more cost effective. Um, now, I think I mentioned before that 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 does not mean that it's necessarily cloud exclusive. So we, we don't want to scare people by saying, okay, microservices means it has to run in the cloud um, because a, a real a good microservices solution is one that can run in the cloud and, and actually benefits the most from running in the cloud, but can also be run all the way up to from a laptop all the way up to that, that cloud environment. Uh, and that's really the, the benefits, or one of the benefits of microservices is that that uh, that flexibility in deployment. And right, and you anticipated what I was thinking there, and it, you know, the, the, the idea of cloud enabled, it, it shouldn't, or cloud native, it, it shouldn't give, leave people the impression, right, that it's, this is only really important, microservices, this discussion is only really important is if, um, if you're moving you know, if you're ready to move some of your operations to the cloud, right? It's, it's something that's, that, that should be, there, there's benefits beyond that, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that is important, that microservices don't necessarily equal cloud. And again, that's typically where you hear about them. Um, I think it's better to, to think about microservices um, as an approach to any sort of software deployment um, or development and deployment. Um, and this basically means that it's applicable anywhere you might have a software-based solution. Um, so from COT servers to uh, VMs within a, or controlled by a hypervisor or containers in an on-prem data center or, uh, or even the third-party cloud environment, microservices should be able to be deployed in all of these situations. Uh, now, it's true, the largest benefits of microservices can be realized when deploying in a more flexible environment, so cloud or virtualization approaches like NFB or containers like Docker, they do offer a speed and flexibility that, that really best suit the, the goals, like the agility goals that Microsoft or Microsoft microservices offers. Um, but pretty much any deployment infrastructure can benefit from the visibility, um, the upgradability, uh, and the isolation from risk that microservices offers you. And 
and just sort of following up on that, because you mentioned, I think, some of the characteristics, right, or the benefits. So maybe now's a good time um, to get into that discussion, right, the characteristics of microservice design architecture and, and the benefits that those qualities bring to media companies, uh, talking about in terms of, you know, technology innovation and support for new business models. Can you just go through a few of the, you know, the, the, the benefits of, essentially the benefits of microservices design architecture? Sure. Um, I think when we talk about the benefits, it's also kind of useful to to kind of couple that against some of the characteristics of um, microservices. So uh, we, we talked about a black box um, and having its restricted functionality. Well, so one of the things, basically by definition, microservices are granular. Um, almost by definition, microservices are, are granular, in fact. So what that gives is the greatest level of flexibility, really trying to overcome the limitations of that um, big monolithic black box um, application. Um, but also, uh, that that granularity, as I mentioned before, allows you to add or, or incorporate new technology. Um, and because these are isolated applications, it's not just easier, but it, it's usually faster to develop and add to the solution. Um, so the the goal here is is to future-proof yourself, so you aren't in that handcuffed situation, one where you do have that extensibility to new technologies. Um, and in fact, in an ideal microservices model, um, we, we often hear this term of continuous deployment, and that goal is to to mean that you're getting access to new technologies. Uh, as soon as they become available effectively as microservices without having to wait for big monolithic builds to be deployed. Um, and, and a true microservices architecture really um, uh, is one that makes utilizing them easier. Um, so it should be something that's open to third-party integrations as well so that customers can actually take advantage of some of these benefits themselves um, so that they aren't necessarily tied to the initial vendor that, that should allow them the greatest level of adaptability. Um, it also means new uh, or easier technologies can be added in isolation. So I mentioned being able to explore these new uh, business models or these new uh, experiments, let's say. Um, they should be able to make these changes, and perhaps it's not just for new business models. Maybe it's just for performance improvements or um, things of that nature. Well. Microservices allows you to do that without sort of risking that big picture. Um, they can simply add in new microservices, perhaps operating in parallel, uh, without bringing down their other applications. And th those could be existing monolithic applications. So you could sort of extend, uh, extend it almost in a hybrid way. Um, and the idea is that you can then explore new business models without, uh, without dis disrupting those bread and butter operations. Um, Microservices allow you uh, freedom of scale. So um, this is sort of an interesting concept in that typically when we talk about scale, we're referring to increasing the number of channels, and that's perfectly valid for microservices. Um, but they can they cannot just scale um, horizontally, or rather uh, vertically. They can scale horizontally. Um, so what I mean by that is that you can actually change the characteristics of an individual channel much more easily. You can add additional layers or additional functionality. Um, so yes, you can add more channels, but you can add more depth and richness or functionality to an existing channel um, by using a microservices model. So it's that whole concept of, let, let, let's say, deep and wide um, scalability that, that microservices offers. Uh, and then finally, um, microservices do offer the greatest level of visibility um, and control. So because you're actually seeing exactly what's happening at a low level, um, you, you, you can really look very, very uh, low level into the processing of your application. Um, and they should be controllable and uh, interfaceable via standards-based APIs so that you can tap into any point in the chain. Uh, the idea is that you can get deeper telemetry, so not just what information that black box is offering you, but at any step along the, the chain. You should be able to tap into it uh, and review what's happening, um, measure what's happening, uh, and, and ideally uh, modify or optimize what's happening so that you can overcome bottlenecks and um, really sort of improve your operations. Those are some of the sort of higher level um, 
characteristics, but also the benefits of like why those characteristics are important and beneficial in a microservices environment. Got it. Very good. Very good. Um, so going back a second to the, the Netflix um, and other new media companies, they all started out in the cloud, sort of, um, you know, on cost equipment, commercial off-the-shelf equipment. Now that's not the case for most broadcasters, right? Uh, who have legacy systems, you know, maybe decades old, right? So, so how can a media company um, that's currently not in in a microservices environment, how, how can um, a media company migrate uh, to a microservices-based architecture? Yeah, that that's actually a common concern. Um, but I, I guess the way I, I often respond to, to this from customers with big investments in existing infrastructure is that it's very similar to, to our, the already accepted transition to adopting software-based solutions. So they, they have their existing perhaps, you know, sort of a big iron or appliance-based uh, infrastructure today. Um, and they have been able to augment it with software-based or COTS-based solutions without necessarily having to um, completely forklift or remove those existing um, those existing appliances in that infrastructure. The fact is is that it, it, there's just such an investment there that even if, if you needed to, most customers couldn't do that um, because not only is it expensive, but that's what's running their day-to-day, -day and they can't afford to be taking that down and spinning it up, um, you know, do a, a full migration of, of services. Um, away and and very much like software based um, solutions, microservices can be added in. Um, I mean, one of the big benefits of microservices that we mentioned before is the fact that you can add new services easily without disrupting existing operations. Um, and that that applies not just to an existing microservices architecture, but also existing uh, infrastructure. Um, there's really no reason from a technical or business standpoint, why traditional infrastructure can't coexist with a microservices deployment and then gradually extend over time to add new functionality or transition functionality um, to that, that latest software-based or microservices solution. And that being said, it, it's true that the, the greatest benefit, or the greatest level of efficiency um, would require a, a larger transition. Um, but I often find that the biggest barrier is is more with the way that we're used to, to dealing with it. It's more about the operator's mindset. Um, so most of us still think like traditional broadcast engineers, and I mean that's sensible because this is traditional or this is broadcast, but it's no longer traditional. Uh, and I think instead, what we need to do is start thinking more like network engineers. Um, like we've already started to embrace this idea of software-based and IP-based infrastructure. Um, and, and microservices is really the next step or the next stage in that. Very good. Okay. All right. So up until now, most of this presentation um, and discussion, it, it's been more of a, a PSA, right, a, a public service announcement. Uh, we want everyone to move forward um, towards a microservices architecture, and I think you've done a great job of articulating why why it's beneficial uh, to make that move and to, and to, to go in that direction. Um, and that's regardless of the, your technology partner of choice, right? Uh, but we obviously, uh, Magic Communications, we practice what we preach. And if you visit our website and follow us in the media, you know, you, you quickly discover that microservices and cloud native have been on our minds for some time now. Right, so at, at this point, Baron, Darren, if you could just briefly uh, sort of the commercial part of the presentation, just talk a little bit about what Imagine, Imagine Communications is enabling in terms of microservices architecture. Okay, sounds good. Um, so that solution is something that we refer, refer to as Xenium. So Xenium itself is uh, Imagine's internal platform or internal framework that we use for um, software-based and virtualized productization and solutions. So basically, we use it internally, or we have been using it internally, uh, to create new product. And this new product generally ranges from things like live stream encoders all the way up to cloud-based playout servers. Uh, and from a marketing standpoint, we often refer to these solutions as powered by Xenium. That's sort of our tagline, um, sort of similar to, to Intel inside. Um, essentially, it's our secret sauce for the creation of products and functionalities that uh, are, are going to be or need to be deployable in cloud or virtualized or COTS-based, you know, software-based uh, environments. 
Um, basically, what Zenium is, is a catalog of individual components, um, and each of these components represent discrete functionality, and then we leverage this component-based architecture um, for faster development, common reuse, um, dynamic deployment, things like that. Um, so by way of example, we may have a Zenium component that is just responsible for ABC encoding. We might have another that's just responsible for transport stream multiplexing, and then maybe another for a graphic overlay. We can connect these components together, and the, we, we, we call that connection together something uh, uh, known as a blueprint. Um, we connect them together to uh, achieve a particular functionality required by a product. So as a basic example, if we wanted to create a live streaming encoder, we would take an IP source component, we connect it to uh, a transport stream demuxer, to a decoder, then to an encoder component, and then to a TS muxer component, and then, then to an IP output component. And this chain basically allows us to, to become a live streaming encoder. Now, if we want to modify that instead to support a product that needs to capture to disk, so maybe it's a, a live ingest component, that last component, that IP output component in the, the live streaming in encoder or transcoder, uh, would be to, to add a file writer component. And just by adding that file writer component, we've now created a new type of workflow, um, and that basically supports a new productization activity. So we get a lot of that reuse um, and a lot of flexibility in our productization activities uh, and, and our responsiveness to, to customer needs. So that type of architecture should sound familiar because it, it, in fact, directly mirrors the microservices style of uh, development. And it, in fact, Zenium itself is an actual pure microservices architecture. Uh, it's actually the, the only true microservices platform in our industry today. Um, when, we just started, when we started developing this several years ago, um, we didn't necessarily refer to it as microservices. Uh, that term is, is relatively new, let's say. Um, but we did a, identify a need for this type of software model, this type of approach to development and deployment, uh, particularly because we were seeing the, the need for cloud and virtualized solutions, or rather the success of cloud and virtualized solutions. So over time, what we've done is we've built up this catalog of, of components, each representing a discrete functionality. And, uh, we have quite a number. We have over a thousand discrete components in our catalog today, um, each representing that separate functionality, uh, such as I've given examples to uh, already. Um, it, it, but in fact, what's happened now is we've reached such a critical mass that we're now starting to work with customers to work directly with that Zenium framework. Uh, so rather than just us internally leveraging that Zenium framework to create product, uh, we're now extending this to customers um, and basically exposing access to this huge catalog of components to create flexible and customized or tailored microservices deployments uh, for our customers. Now, we recognize that not all customers are ready to, to embrace or transition to microservices, um, but for those that are, um, we're ready to support them with this Zenium framework. Ah, very good, uh, Darren, and that, that really brings us um, pretty much to a, a close of what we have prepared. I just have a couple questions that I that I'm looking at that are coming in uh, that I think are quite good too and, and relevant. Because one thing we haven't got to is you know maybe the downside. It's all been you know goodness and greatness talking about microservices, but <laughs> are, are there any disadvantages or issues um, with the microservices design architecture? Whether it's R&D cost or, or um, anything else you can think of? Uh, no, it's perfect. There's, there's no, <laughs> no, no. The, the fact is, is that there, there is an overhead to this type of orchestration or coordination of separate um, services. Um, it, for a lot of sort of hard and fast functionality, it might be more performant to, to have everything done in a single separate process, um, all shared in the same memory. Um, but as you might imagine, that comes with the, the rigidity. That, and that's sort of the, 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 I guess that's the comparison. Um, you do incur an overhead cost. Um, and really, the, the way that we generally try to overcome that overhead is uh, through the scale that, that cloud or um, 
scalable virtualized technologies offers us. Um, but when you isolate these in separate processes um, and then you try to connect them together and orchestrate them, there's an overhead to that. So it's not always going to be as, as performant. Uh, and I'd say that that's probably the best uh, or one of the key sort of uh, uh, issues. Um, there's also a coordination aspect. Um, so mm -hmm. oftentimes with a baked product that has a monolithic sort of functionality, there's a user interface that's very much tailored and specific to that. Um, from a, a higher level, uh, you need to coordinate those microservices. And uh, in terms of how Imagine is handling that, we do have um, projects and existing functionality that allows you to coordinate that, or we can work with customers to coordinate that. Um, but that is an element of complexity that comes into microservices. How do you coordinate these various separate microservices to, to come together to meet an end-to-end -end workflow? So, so that would be another sort of downside. Got it. And uh, this one might be involved, a little bit involved, uh, and we, but we do have a few minutes left. But um, And this sort of gets into that, that uh, realm of, of you know, software-defined networking and, and, um, and some of the cloud ar architecture. But um, what about things like OpenStack and uh, network functions, virtualization, NFT? Um, uh, how do they pertain to microservices? Mm. Okay, so I think that oftentimes when people talk microservices, uh, they they kind of do so in a way where, for whatever reason, they're they're perceived or presented as distinct or separate operations to NFV or to containers. Um, the fact is is that they're actually fairly complementary, or they can be complementary. Um, there's no reason that you can't deploy a microservice. Uh, using an NFE architecture or, or using um, OpenStack. Uh, in fact, those types of, um, like an NFE orchestrator or director, uh, could be very um, useful in overcoming some of the uh, orchestration concerns or, or complexities that I described before. Um, so it's very much complementary or, or containers. They, they can be the container itself could be, um, it could contain the microservice. And now ideally what you have is a flexible microservice architecture that allows you to change the behavior of that very easily, but that's really one of the benefits that, that containers offer you. So I think the, the main point there is that microservices are compatible all the way from um, uh, bare metal installs all the way up through containers. So it should be compatible uh, with all of those technologies rather than separate uh, considerations. Very good. And uh, uh, just a couple I see to come through in the, in the chat side of things. Um, the question is, do, um, uh, does a microservice, microservices design capability exist across all operating systems, um, talking Windows, Apple? Linux, et cetera. I guess the question is, um, the, 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 the crux of the question is, um, are microservices generic and that they can be moved from OS to OS without major issues or rewrites? Okay, so microservices as an architecture should allow for um, microservices offered or supported or deployed on separate operating systems to function together. And the reason for that is that microservices all should uh, communicate via a common uh, API or a common um, uh, backplane, a communication backplane. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to all be running on the same operating system. Uh, however, there are going to be microservices that are limited to deployment functionality on a particular operating system. And that's really more about how that or a particular microservice is developed. Uh, and a, a typical way of looking at that would be, um, perhaps I've developed a microservice that um, has native code for performance reasons that um, only works on a Windows system. Well, in that scenario, uh, that underlying library that, that is needed to run on a Linux platform, for example, wouldn't be e usable on a Windows platform. So. Microservices as a design architecture should be transportable uh, and uh, 
that communicable between different operating systems or microservices hosted on oper different operating systems. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every microservice will run on every um, operating system. Got it. Okay. Now here's another one. Here's a Xenium specific one. The, the question is, what is the end-to-end -end latency of a Xenium system performing some of these harder functions, um, and specifically mentioned uh, encoding? Is that is that something you can uh, put a finger on? Uh, I can. Um, so it really depends on what type of processing you're doing. Um, and in fact, when we implement a particular workflow in uh, a Xenium Blueprint, part of the consideration is what the requirements for an end-to-end -end latency would be. Um, so it could be uh, as low as just two to three frames. Uh, I don't think we have any existing components that are, are, are less than a frame in latency, um, or any, let's say, blueprints that are less than a frame in latency. Uh, that's difficult to achieve in a pure uh, software-based uh, environment. Um, although we are improving that, we are working towards overcoming that, and there's nothing inherent about microservices or nothing inherent about Xenium that would make that impossible. Uh, it's just the typical applications that we've been using thus far um, permit that, that sort of, you know, three to three frame uh, set of latency. On the other hand, if you're looking to have a lot of buffering uh, or perhaps you're encoding to some type of um, distribution technology like HLS, well, then the end-to-end -end latency is going to be much longer because you, what you do is you create 10-second segments and write them to disk and then upload them at the end, in which case the latency is technically 10 seconds plus however many frames are associated with the processing. Um, but I think the, the root of that question is more about um, whether or not we're able to achieve the same sort of performance in software that you can achieve in hardware. Uh, and there is going to be some give and take. When you have a dedicated hardware application, uh, all being run on the same board or SOC, for example, um, that's going to be more performant than when it's run in software. But the fact is, is that it's getting very close, and the fact is it's not even necessarily relevant today. And, and by that I mean CPUs are so fast today, and our ability to leverage them in the indi individual uh, low-level um, uh, processing components, there are components in the Xenium framework that are completely optimized. Um, all the way down to the SSC uh, uh, level so that we can do things like very, very fast um, deinterlacing or very, very fast overlays. And there's a lot of almost assembly level code that goes into optimizing the performance of that, um, whereas others, they don't have the same sort of level of, of performance requirements. So we might implement it just in a, a pure Java, Java implementation where it's interfacing with the database because that doesn't have that real-time performance. So Xenium as an architecture um, is designed to allow for it to leverage not just um, uh, those sort of uh, non-real-time uh, performance characteristics, but also be a very performant real-time platform uh, and that actually goes down to not just CPU. We have GPU-enabled components. We have hardware processing-based components. Um, but Xenium then becomes a framework that we can leverage all of that together to achieve a microservices platform or even a product if it's used in its traditional way. Got it. One of the last ones I see here is uh, the question is that, that uh, microservice architecture sounds like a great advancement for manufacturers like Imagine, but how does um, the architecture <coughs> design benefit the end user? Are there configuration advantages, flexibilities? And I'm, I'm thinking end user, um, the, the question is referring to um, the consumers or video viewers, or is, I don't know what your interpretation of that is, Darren, if that helps you answer the question. Mm -hmm. uh, I initially took that uh, as, as our customers, those who are it could be. providing it could be, the services. Yeah. Um, I mean, to the, to the end consumer, i.e. the viewer, um, well, they're the ones who are really driving this. Uh, this sort of solution is how do we respond to to those um, to those uh, demands, the changing consumer landscape. Uh, I'm going to choose to interpret that question as uh, how does it how does it benefit uh, operators, people who are using this this type of equipment versus yeah. how does it benefit someone like Imagine? So, mm -hmm. Imagine has used a similar sort of technology architecture, uh, Xenium, um, as an example to create and uh, to create products more quickly and with a greater level of reuse. So that's our internal benefit. 
but the whole microservices solution set and the whole um, the whole concept of microservices isn't even really something that we use ourselves. And we have a microservices platform that we use to create product, but when it actually becomes a microservices architecture, we're really talking about how an operator, how like a broadcaster, for example, would use this platform. And it's with all of those same benefits. It's the ability to change their behavior, to change their operation structure uh, without having to modify big black boxes and monolithic applications the ability to spin up new resources without having a big forklift operations. It's the ability to do that without having to disrupt other apps. It's all the benefits, basically, that we described. Um, those are all really relevant to how a broadcaster would make use of a microservices platform um, rather than how we would actually benefit from it. Um, so I think, that, I think that all of the benefits that we've described, most if not all of the benefits that we've described, um, are uh, relevant to the broadcaster because what we're talking about doing is exposing that big catalog of components, that big catalog of technology um, to the end user. Uh, and that end user, of course, being you know the operators, our customers.